Hello and welcome back to DivideTheWord.blog. Today we're continuing our three-part series called Coping with the Cults and Spiritually Abusive Churches. In part one, which I'm going to link in the description below, we took the time to define what we mean by that word cult because it's inflammatory, it causes all sorts of emotions and, and eyebrows go up and question marks pop out. So please watch part one called Separation to really get the understanding of what we mean by a cult. And part two today is on judgmentalism. And you know, the most common fear or outcome as a result of leaving one of these style churches, spiritually abusive church, a cult style church, is that, that, that judgmentalism, that fear of judgmentalism. It's something you actually can feel. You hear their whispers, you feel their stares, you know that you're being judged by your difference, you don't conform to their mold anymore. You don't go to church when they say you have to be at church. Maybe you're breaking some of the dress standards if that style church had dress standards. There's all sorts of ways that judgmentalism comes in. The saddest part to me that I've experienced is when it's done by little kids. You see these little kids, I have family that still goes to the church I exited from. And when you get around for a, a dinner or a lunch or a family event, you feel this wall of barrier between you and the children because those children as young as possible are being taught that we're the only right way, we're the only saved people, we're the only good people, and people who leave the church are ten times worse than they were when they came into the church, so you got to avoid them. We can't let them taint our kids. And then when you get around those kids, you actually feel that wall. And it's so, so very sad. Uh, one of the most glaring and obvious signs of a cult-style church is that they require your entire social circle to revolve around them your job, your family, your friends, uh, your entertainment, everything you do as a social creature must revolve around the organization and stay within the organization. And if you start to do things outside of the organization, you're called into the pastor's office, you're called into question, your behavior is suspect because they want you to do everything with them only so they can control you. Fellowship with outsiders is forbidden. Friendship with the world, they say, is enmity with God the Father, and yet they've perverted that word world. We are supposed to be friends to the world, a light to the world, a light that is set upon a hill that should not be hidden, and yet cult-style organizations want to keep you wrapped up into this tiny little box. I told my uh, wife many years ago, I said, if things keep going the way they're going in our church, we're going to be in a commune soon. And that's, that's hard to say, but that is what a cult-style church will bring you to. So, so in part two of Coping with the Cults, Judgmentalism, I really quickly want to define what is judgmentalism. We're human beings. We have human nature. We all have the nature to be judgmental at points. But in the vein of cults and spiritually abusive churches, judgmentalism is an, is an absolutely necessary result of a superiority attitude, an attitude that we are the only organization that's saved. And every cult-style organization does this, and I don't mean to offend anybody if I name things, but if you talk to Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, many sects of standard Christianity, I came out of an apostolic Pentecostal uh, under the umbrella of the United Pentecostal Church International, and they all think the same thing. We got the modern revelation, we're now the saved people. People who do not do what we do or believe what we believe, follow the pattern that we set, are lost to hell. And so the natural result of that is you look at everybody else and you realize if they're not like me, they're not saved. And if they're not doing what I do, they're suspect. They're to be avoided. We can try to get them into our way, but if they don't come our way, we push them back into the seas of the world. And that is judgmentalism. That is to say that if somebody doesn't dress just like me, then they're lost. And I shouldn't be their friend. And if I am their friend, it is only for the purpose of winning them to my church way. And if they don't come my way again, we cut the relationship off and we move somewhere else. For instance, the holiness standards in the United Pentecostal Church are big and broad, but the two most obvious is that women are not allowed to wear pants. And they say that a woman wearing pants violates Deuteronomy chapter 22, where it says not to wear that which pertaineth to a man, cross-dressing, uh, trying to become the opposite sex that you are. Now, 
not going to go into that topic point. This is just to reveal their standard. So women cannot wear pants. And secondly, men cannot have long hair, and women are not to cut their hair. Right? The Bible says that it's good for a woman to have long hair. It doesn't actually say what that long length is. The United Pentecostal Church believes that if you snip off even your dead ends, off to hell with you. Furthermore, the church I exited from took this a bit farther uh, and said that even watching television or movies, off to hell. Wearing short sleeve shirts or shorts on your legs, off to hell. No scripture for this stuff, of course, but it's just the standards that they've taken. And it wasn't even like a, this is a good lifestyle choice we recommend. It was, if you don't do this, you're not one of us. And if you're not one of us, you're outside. And if you're outside, you're anathema. You're going to hell. Men aren't to have facial hair. Women need to wear pantyhose if they're doing anything outside or in social settings. Uh, and they use Hebrews 12.14 to define this, which says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, holiness is inward, but they define it as those dress standards. And then they can use that as a judgmental platform to say, Look, they're in pants. That woman's in pants. She's got a necklace on. She's wearing makeup. She's cut her hair. She's not one of us. She's not a Christian. She might think she's a Christian, but she's not a Christian. The most common phrase I heard in my church when they condemned other churches, and they would call out the Baptists and the Lutherans and the whatever, and they would say they're sincere, but they're sincerely wrong, and they're wrong in going to a devil's hell. And so with this mentality, you can now judge other people based on their lifestyle choices, the kind of clothes they wear, the kind of shoes they wear, the things they watch, the things they listen to. And one person in my old church saw a woman standing on the side of the road wearing pants, and this person had come to our church before, and she instantly judged that person's uh, spiritual status. Look, she said, there she is wearing her, her pants like a man. She's lost. She's not going to make it. Very, very sad. Another example uh, of this is... Uh, the bishop of my old church rolled up to a house I was at in my work, my line of business. I was with another business partner. We were standing in front of a house. The bishop of my church pulls up in his truck, looks at the man I'm talking to, uh, comments to him, and I wave and say hi, and he completely ignored me. He had a 30-second conversation with the man I'm with, said goodbye. I waved, said goodbye. Again, wouldn't even look at me. Drove off. That was the end of it. That judgmentalism is a result of me coming outside of their social circle, right? So that is what judgmentalism is. Another man decided to leave uh, the church, and the pastor literally told him, you know what, we'll see whose kids are better off in 30 years. That'll tell us who's right and wrong in this decision. So, so sad. This is why judgmentalism is a stumbling block, which is what we're not supposed to do. Who in the world is going to come back to that church? Or who could have their faith crushed and turned from God due to that judgmentalism? We are not supposed to put stumbling blocks in front of each other. Rather, we're supposed to use the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. The Bible says, without which there is no law. Against such, there is no law, excuse me. So so what do we do to deal with it? This is coping with the cults and judgmentalism. How do we deal with it? Because it's real, it's raw, and it hurts. Number one, learn in your heart that God is the only one who can and will and has the right to judge you. Jesus is the judge of the quick and the dead. And if you look at the model of Jesus Christ through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John into the book of Acts, there is only one set of people that he ever criticized and judged. And that was those legalists, Pharisees, and the Sadducees. If you've got those kind of people judging you, brush it off because those are the kind of people that are God judged and criticized. If other flawed human beings are judging you, they're doing it to their own peril. And so we have to get it in our heart that to, to brush it off, like water off a duck's back. Just let it go. Don't, don't let it spring up in you and, and be a root of bitterness. Just let it go. God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. Romans 5 8. Just like that little woman, uh, that adulteress in John chapter 8. It's a story I go back to all the time. They bring this woman caught in adultery. Could have been that hour, that day, that week, that month. We don't know, but it was real raw. And they brought this woman to Jesus and said, Jesus, what are you going to do about this? This woman was taken in adultery. And they said, you know, Jesus, that the law says we're to pick up stones and, and kill her. And so Jesus said, how about whatever one of you has never sinned, you go ahead and cast the first stone. And they all realized we're all sinners. We're all unholy and impure, so we can't cast a stone at this woman. And after they left, Jesus asked her, Woman, where are all these men who condemned you? And she said, They're gone, Lord. No man condemns me. And, and Jesus Christ said, Neither do I condemn thee. Jesus Christ is not here to condemn you. He came to bring love and joy. And yes, God is a God of grace and justice. But his grace came to take the place of the, ju the legal requirement for justice. And so we've got to stop allowing other men, women, to judge us. We are going to be judged by the Almighty God. And in 1 Samuel 16, the Lord told Samuel, You're looking at this, Samuel. You're looking at somebody's stature, their clothing, their social status, their money. Wrong thing to do. God is going to look at their heart and that's what we need to do. Number two, surround yourself with non-judgmental people. Get into other social groups. It's going to feel awkward at first because you've lived in a cult-style structure that taught you being around outsiders is evil and bad and dirty. It's going to taint you. We used to teach the old idea that if I took a ball and I rolled it around in mud and I threw it at you, would you get all muddy? The answer is yes. And that was our analogy to say, see, if you're playing ball with dirty outsiders, you're going to get dirty. <sighs> that is not the way Jesus Christ approached this life. It's not the gospel. Surround yourself with those people, even if it's uncomfortable. Get on social groups. Um, social media, it's got its good and it's bad, and there's a lot of bad. But you can also find groups that are good, like spiritualabuse.org or uh, cult awareness groups, and even just social groups. You want to sew, you want to play basketball, you want to play racquetball, soccer. You just want to get together with people and have a social circle of people who will accept you, even if you dress different, even if you talk different, even if you look different. Go find those people. Surround yourself with non-judgmentalists. And I hate to say it because some of my pro-Christian audience, and I'm still a Christian, but my pro-Christian audience will, will not like what I'm about to say. But I'm going to say it anyway because it was important for me and my health and my development after coming out of a cult. Surround your people with secular, or surround yourself, I'm sorry, with secular people, non-church people. Get together with church people. My advice has always been take some time off church, figure out who you are and what you want, and then go find another loving church family. But also surround yourself with people who are not in a church because you're always going to have what I call denomination lock. And that is, you go to a Baptist church, they're going to want you to be like the Baptists. You go to a Lutheran church, they're going to want you to be like the Lutherans, etc., 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 etc. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're coming out of a locked-in situation like a cult, you need freedom and expression to figure out who you are and what you want. So, again, uh, find secular, non-church-like groups to be a part of. And number three... Don't let bitterness spring up and you behave in the same manner. After I left the church, I started wearing facial hair. And an in-law would begin to criticize me and call me names uh, because I was wearing facial hair. In my church, men weren't allowed to have facial hair and he doesn't have any because he's not allowed to. Now, I could have been a jerk and spit back stuff like, yeah, fatty, or something like that. But all that would have done was eroded my witness to this person. And so if we let bitterness spring up, we can't be an effective tool for them. And they start looking at us and saying, you know, I was always taught he was going to turn into this terrible person for leaving the church, but he hasn't. He's actually a very kind person. I wonder if there's something to this. So don't let bitterness spring up. I expose the badness of these places all the time. And the people who are there say, I'm just bitter. But I've had hundreds of people respond to my YouTube videos, the blog, 
Facebook, social media groups saying, I'm so thankful for what you're doing because I was that person and I needed to hear somebody say it. Then I would realize I'm not alone and I have now this encouragement to continue on and do better. You don't have to be bitter to expose wrongs. Do it with that fruit of the Spirit in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You can be the influence for change to the people who are still in that organization and need a way out. So coping with the cult is not going to be easy, right? In this case, you've got to realize that only God can judge you. You need to surround yourself by uh, other people who are non-judgmental, secular and Christian, and you need to not become bitter. You need to keep your attitude right. And that third point is the hardest, but through prayer and through time and through exercise, you really can do it. Judgmentalism runs deep. It's in the roots of cult-style organizations. Coming out of it means it's going to take time to unprogram that from your mind and your subconscious, your psyche, but just keep doing it. Pray it out. Battle it out. Keep it up time and time again until you really feel settled and at peace. Uh, I remember when my sister left our church years before I did, and my mother, God rest her soul, she would come to me and say, Ralph, why do they have to be so mean to her, they being leadership and other people in the church? And I said, Mom, because they have to. If you're going to be in that style of an organization, you have to conform. You have to waddle after Mama Duck. you got to be just like them. And that judgmentalism has to trickle down into everybody. Uh, so realize that it's real. Realize people do it because they're taught to and they feel like they have to to fit in. Don't let it be a root of bitterness. Don't hate for it. Just realize that you can be an agent of change to bring them out by you living the right way. Most importantly, you can slowly etch away at the scars that are in your own soul over this through time, uh, through realizing that everybody outside of the church is not evil and wicked. Get new friends, meet new people, and enjoy a life that is filled with those fruits of the Spirit uh, because you need it. If you're going to live a healthy life, in your heart, in your soul, your mind. And if you're going to be an influence to other people, expose the evil, expose the wrong, talk about it, but do it in a loving spirit, and that will bring others to you. So I hope this helped. That was part two in Coping with the Colts. Part one was on separation. Today was on judgmentalism. Our next video will be on spiritual abuse and the impacts of spiritual abuse. I'm going to, again, link the uh, first video and the blog post in the description of this video. I hope you hit that like button and subscribe so that you get notifications uh, when we post new articles. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, wonderful life. We'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care.